morning congregation of the living God, our Father. We are so thankful uh, to be a part of that which the Father has established for all eternity. If you are one that felt this morning or last night, dang, I got to get up and go to church. If you felt that way, let me, let me encourage you right quick. In, in uh, the book of Lamentations, uh, chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, the steadfast of the Lord never ceases. Remember that. His love never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Just think about his steadfast love and his mercy and his faithfulness never ending. I look forward to Sundays, but I'm struggling on Wednesdays because I, I have to be up at 2.30. 2.45 in the morning and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sleepy at 7 o'clock, 7.30 when Bible study starts. So I'm like, okay, Lord, you got to help me in that area. Give me strength. But something went wrong. Please try again. all the time but well, we we want to thank uh the reading of the scriptures this morning today's lesson is not loving the world in the things in the world when we look at god's creation it's a beautiful thing it's hard not to love the world but we must understand there are three aspects of this word world or cosmos with the K. You see, when we see nature in itself, the sun, the moon, and the stars, just greatness and, and Niagara Falls and uh, the rivers, the rushing rivers and water, and it's grand, it's beautiful to see God's creation. But in reading, uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, we understand that at this point in John's life, John is an elder now. He is the aged one. That's why he uses the term, my little children, in the opening verse of chapter 2. You see, he writes in verse 12, he says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. He says, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And he says, I am writing to you, young men, because... You have overcome the evil one. He goes on to say, I write to you, children, because you know him who is from the beginning. And he says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And he says, I write to you, young man, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the desires thereof. For whosoever does the will of God abides forever. Such 
Mike and what John is saying, there is room for all. John says, by way of the Holy Spirit, do not love the world nor the things in the world. There is a reason why John is saying, do not love the world nor the things in the world. You're probably thinking, well, the things in the world, what are they? We're going to get to it. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We must understand that's one reason why we should not love the world nor the things in the world because it lies in the power of the evil one. Christ came and delivered us from such a place as in Galatians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. You see, though we are in the world, we are not of the world, according to St. John chapter 17 and verses 14 through 16. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You see, people are perishing every day. Why? People are perishing because of unbelief in the gospel. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If the mind is blind, your eyes are no good. Your eyes are no good. Mind blind, eyes no good. I can show a person something in the scriptures. If the mind is blind, they're not going to even see it. Can't see it. So thanks be to the Lord God that he unstopped our ears this morning. That he gave us vision this morning. That he has given us the understanding to know the importance of the gospel and the salvation. The great deliverance from a place that is going to be hit with fire. May not be in our day, but it's going to take place for the Lord has promised us that heaven and earth will be rolled up according to Hebrews chapter 1 verses 10 through 12. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. How is he going to do this? He says he's going to roll it up. In one instance, the universe will be set on fire, according to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. That is why it is very important for us to be, to live and strive to be holy in all of our conversations and godly that we may escape the dangers of what we are reading. You see, he's going to roll it up and then he's gonna throw it in the fire. It's just like the wheat and the tares. What enemy has done this? I thought we planted all wheat. Now the tares grow with the wheat. No, we'll wait until the end and then we'll separate and we'll 
bind all the tares together and throw them in the fire. The thought, you see, Christ, our message is not to frighten or to scare, it's to persuade that you may end up in a better place. You see, the world that we live in has a mask on it. It looks all glamorous and good, but it's the devil's mask. It's just like nowadays we wear these protections and people use them as a covering to hide their true identity when they go and do crime. We see it all the time. Oh, he had a, he had a black hood on, he had a mask on, but did you see what he looked like? No, nah, I couldn't see. That's a mask. This evil one, say the devil, does not appear directly in our text scriptures. He does not appear. Instead, he wears the mask of the world and of Antichrist. Anyone who does not believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is Antichrist. No one would love the devil if he were to appear directly to you. You'd probably fall down and have a heart attack. You see that? But everyone loves the world. The world is Satan's mask that he uses to deceive and cheat us out of eternity with Christ. We must not go out like that. We must hold firm to what the scriptures teaches us when it comes to forgiving a brother and forgiving a sister. Why? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Satan has designs and schemes to lead you away. When you read in Genesis chapter 3, you see that of the fields of all the animals that God created, the beasts that God created, we see that Satan was at the top of the list. This schemer, great schemer, he'll lead you astray so quick. So we're not ignorant of his designs and his disguises as in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Paul says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond with their deeds. We have so many false teachers in the world today that when people hear the truth of the gospel, the eternal gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it does this. Whoop. Right. We are this, we are that, but we have been warned of these things beforehand. What Jesus said, how scoffers will walk after their own lust and speak in speaking things that they ought not speak, you see. So the problem is not with the devil. Let us understand that it is with the world as the devil's mask because he has set up everything he don't have to do nothing but just kick back now he relax and let him go i've set everything up now we just fishing that's what he is doing but for those who love material things according to their lustful desire satan will appear wearing the mask of the world you're not going to be able to see it because you don't understand it. If you have not been educated through the scriptures, you're not going to see it. But we are here to reveal it to you. For those who love material things according to their lustful desires, Satan will appear wearing a mask. As in Matthew chapter 20, at 16, verses 26. As many people strive for things in this life, wealth, gold, and diamonds, and position, and everything, not even thinking about the consequences, 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in return for his soul? Luke 9.25 says, For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? His soul is himself. You want to you want to gain the whole world and lose everything. But for those who are of the faith of Christ and care for the things that are in accordance with the gospel or doctrine of Christ, Satan will appear or come with another mask. He's going to come at you to try to draw you away from the true teachings of the Bible and try to lead you away with heretical teachings. Teachings that deny Christ, teachings that deny the body of Christ, teaching that deny that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Teachings that, that there are many bodies of Christ that wears different names. It's okay, you can pick one and go to any one you want to. This is how he comes. We must expose him for who he is, the father of lies, he lied so well until he has come to deceive the whole world. He figured out how can I deceive the whole world? Through religion. I can get them to think that they can believe anything they want and still go to heaven. You see, it doesn't work like that because God has put in the scriptures, there is one head, one body, one baptism, one faith, one Lord. If you don't know that, and you don't want to believe that, you are in trouble. Next point, definition of the world. St. John chapter 15, St. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Do not love the world, neither the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now think for one second what we have been talking about. If we take away the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What type of world would we have? You wouldn't have to worry about an individual going to a gas station to pump gas, and the next thing you know, three bandits come up and try to rob you for what you got. Why? Because you're not lusted for what he got. You're going to get out, and you're going to work for your own. But we have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, in the pride of life, I want what you got, and I'm going to take it. This is the type of world that we live in, you see. The Greek word for cosmos has more than one meaning. When we look at uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. St. John chapter 17 and verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but, but that you keep them from the evil one. And then Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. What does this indicate? These scriptures we have just went over. The material universe as a system created by God, as I spoke earlier concerning how mighty and awe-inspiring it is when we see waterfalls and the Grand Canyon and things of that nature. Even just the sun is just totally awesome. We serve a being that is conscious of the fact that we are serving him. We must understand that. You see, and in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 29, John says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We see in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death, through sin and so death spread to all men because all sin what we have just witnessed here in these scriptures is fallen the fallen human race corrupted and usurped by Satan as his components 
for his evil system. This is the second aspect of the world. It is the fallen nature of the world, you see. And then finally, we look at the adornments and the adorning of the things of the world when we look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold and jewelry or the clothing you wear. That's another aspect in John 15 and 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. When we look at James chapter four and verse four, ye adulterous people, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This denotes that the system that is set up, the orderly arrangements, this order system is set up by Satan. He is the adversary of God, but it is necessity to have certain things in this creation for us that Satan uses against us. You see, God created man to live on the earth to for the fulfillment of his purpose, but his enemy, Satan, has usurped or exercised power over the man that God had formed to systematize him. Now we have the term, the word systematized to arrange and order with a definite plan or scheme, which is to destroy every human being on the planet. That is what he is trying to do, starting with religion, culture, education, industry, commerce, even with uh, entertainment through man's fallen nature. We must understand that we live in a fallen system. This system is fallen. Why? Because it's created by a fallen man. Everything is falling. We must keep that in our minds. You see, the lust, pleasures, all of our pursuits, even in our indulgence in, in living necessities, such as food, clothing, housing, and transportations. We must remember that this whole satanic system lies in the evil one. Not loving such a world is the, is the ground for overcoming the evil one. You see, loving it just a little bit, give him an opportunity to occupy us and to defeat us. As Saint, uh, Second John 2 and 15 says, that if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. The love of the Father here is our love toward him, generated by his love within us. Now, the love that he has given us, what are we going to do? We're going to love things more than we love him. You see, overcoming the evil one. God has given us the ability to overcome the evil one. You see, according to the, the context, the young men that I spoke about earlier have overcome the evil one, the one who formed this evil system, uh, the one who has systematized all things, all persons, and all matters. How can a young man overcome this evil one? They can overcome him because they have the word of God abiding in them. If you have the word of God abiding in you, then you are able to overcome the evil one. The word of God is in you. Where is it at? Oh, it's in my Bible, in my pocket. Is it anywhere in your being? Uh, I think I know a scripture. Time to go to work. You see, when we get like that, it's time to go to work. The word of God is also our refuge, our stronghold, and our fortress. Day by day, the young men and everyone who is a Christian need to stay in the
the word of God, stay in the word as our refuge, we are protected from the evil one. You must understand that. You must have a reading of the word daily. You must have a daily prayer life. You have to set up times to be able to pray and sing and worship the Lord in the privacy of wherever you are. Go in your closet because God is a God of secret and he will reward you, you see. So we see that the whole world system lies in the evil one according to 2 John 5 and 19. Not only has this evil one systematized everything, but the entire system lies in him. So we must use the analogy of a surgeon. You see, the world is unconscious of the fact of what's going on. When you are hit with a, 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 a drug that knocks you out, hey, watch the clock. By the time that big hand swing around and hit, starts at the six and hit the 12, you're going to be out happens boom out that's the world unconscious of the fact of the things that's going on in the world satan has them on the operating table unconscious that's why the lord tells us to stay awake stay awake don't fall asleep you could be a christian and fall asleep and there goes your reward you see not loving the world according to what john charges us to do do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. He tells us that if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. Not loving the world is the ground for overcoming the evil one. That's what we must understand. The things of the world. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world, according to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, these are the components that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh is the passionate desires of the body. The lust of the eyes is the passionate desires of the soul through the eyes. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? You see, the world has a bad eye. This eye is full of of darkness so you see all kinds of things on the news with the shooting police shooting people other people killing people then the police kill them it's just evil right and the vainglory of life is the empty pride boast confidence assurance and display of material things of the present life these are the components of the world getting ready to close up here the lust of the flesh the passionate desires of the body, it's mainly related to the body because the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil has entered into the human race. As in Romans chapter 12 and verse 5, our body became fallen and corrupted. You see? So, we have, as a result, an evil element coming to our human race, and now this element is our physical body. You see, it is our physical body. From experience, we know that an evil satanic element dwells in our nature. That's why Paul said, according to Romans chapter 7, read it. You'll say, Paul say, there is nothing good in my flesh. It is in my flesh. So people try to pra practice ascetic living by trying to stay away from certain things and beating their bodies down with this strict abstination from self-indulgence. But Paul warned the Colossians of such practice in chapter two and verse 18. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism in the worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason, 
by his sensuous mind. You see, no matter how hard or to what extent people may mistreat their body following ascetic practices, asceticism will not work in dealing with the lust of the body. You see, the lust of the eyes, we understand that, and John also speaks about the lust of the eyes, when the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil came into the human body, the body became flesh. So, the fallen soul and the body work together. We have the vain glory of life, as uh, the pride of life, where John spoke about in 2 and 16. We have seen that the, the pride of life is the empty pride, boast, confidence, look at what I got, look at what position I am in. We, we see all of that. So we understand that the contents of the satanic system all boils down to Satan has used these things from his system. For example, he has created different kinds of food. Satan uses food to form a satanic system, forming an industry. We understand that this is necessary, right? Forming industry is all necessary, but the contents of this system are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We have cars, we have houses. These things are necessary for us, but he uses these things to cause us to lust and desire after and then brag about it when we get it. See, how can a car be utilized by the enemy of God? Simple, just as I had said, the, the car itself is not the problem, it's the lust that I gotta have it. See, we gotta have a dwelling place. Once again, the problem is not with the house. We wanna have good clothes, but we have people that say, if it's not Gucci, I can't wear it. Not Prada, I ain't going to have it. You see, it's what I'm talking about. It's, it's not the clothes. Because the clothes and the cars and the houses and the food and agriculture and all of that has nothing to do with the things that John is talking about. It's about us. And here we go, the Father and his will. As John, 1 John chapter 2 and 17, John goes on to say, and the world is passing away in its lust, but he who practices the will of God abides forever. As the world is against the Father, so the things in the world uh, which are lust are against God's will. On the positive side, we have the Father and his will. On the negative side, we have the world and all the things in the world. The world is against the Father and the things in the world are against his will, according to John's word in verse uh, 2 and 17 in 1 John. The world is passing away and its desires, but he who practiced the will of God abides forever. To practice the will of God is not to do the will. To practice the will of God is to do it habitually. That means constantly and continually, not merely occasionally. The world, the lust, and those who love the world are passing away. But God, his will, and those who do his will will abide forever. If you are not a member of the body of Christ and have been baptized for the remission of sins and striving for righteousness, you are still in the world then you have problems because we of the church of Christ are Hebrews. How does one become a Hebrew as Abraham, the first Hebrew? A Hebrew is one who crosses over, who crosses a river. He is a river cross. All of us who have been baptized into the body of Christ, we are river crosses. We are Hebrews. You never knew what that meant. That's what it means. I want to thank the congregation here and the eldership here and the deaconship here for giving me the opportunity to come and present the eternal word of God to you. And may the Lord open the door of opportunity to the one that has been selected as the one who will be feeding you, your evangelist. 
May the Lord have a blessing to his congregation.